Good morning, church. Good morning, those who are watching online as well. We have a lot going on for Missions Weekend, so hopefully uh, be a part of that. That is our heartbeat here at New Hope, not just uh, generosity for our community, but for the world. And so get plugged in. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome couple weeks and weekends with some amazing missionaries, amazing speakers. So join us for that. You can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. We'll be picking up in verse 20. I'm continuing the and wrapping up this little three-part series before we dive into missions weekends uh, about Jesus and his prayer uh, and breaking that down. And so, love what God has for us this morning. But hey, I just love giving you updates on my family. My son is 13, 14 months. Uh, I'm great at math as well. 14 months, and uh, you'll need to pray for us. He just learned how to say no. So it comes out like, nah, nah. So, and he loves pointing at everything, but he doesn't straighten his finger. So it's like, nah. Nah, it's kind of scary, actually, so pray for us, but he actually is amazing. He constantly is laughing. He's a really good kid, turned out uh, just like his mother, not like me, so. John chapter 17, verse 20, I am praying, this is Jesus, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. This prayer this morning, we are talking about you. Turn your neighbor, say you. Come on, 930, turn your neighbor, say you. You watching at home, you. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. You are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so that, or so they might, be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do, and these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. I love this. It's a prayer for you this morning. It's a prayer for me. Anyone who believes in Jesus, Jesus has taken the time to pray for you. You can see his heart is for his people. His heart is for his church. And as we look back on the past couple weeks with Pastor Zach and Pastor August preaching and breaking down the priorities of Jesus, we see that what he's praying for shows what his heart is and where his priorities lie. And so just overview of the whole chapter, Jesus is praying for the glory of God, the holiness of his church, the unity of his church and sharing the gospel to a lost world. This is what Jesus cares about. And I love when we're talking as a church and we've launched for this year, the culture of joy, J-O-Y. We're talking about Jesus first, others second, and then you third. And, and, and that, that isn't just such a, a, like a cute little template that I live my life by, but it is a powerful biblical template that if I put Jesus first above everything, just like he's praying, the glory of God, then second I, I put my focus is on others and serving and humility, the lost world and ministry of sharing the gospel, unity of the church, others, then the last part is me, and I focus on perfecting holiness in my life. Jesus, others, you. This is what Jesus is praying for, and this is what Jesus' priority in his heart is for you. Back in verse 13 of this chapter in this prayer, Jesus even says, I have said all these things that they might be filled with my joy. It's all connected, that joy and living life truly to the fullest really does mean Jesus first, others second, and me Last, me last. But this morning, I want to focus on the last two priorities in, uh, of this prayer of Jesus, specifically the unity of his church and then the mission of sharing the gospel to the lost. And those are very well connected. They're very well connected, and it's not an accident it's, it, that Jesus is praying for them 
in tandem. And so uh, I think of all these things, once again, that Jesus could pray for. I mean, look at our world today. He could be, we need to put a lot more prayer than what he's covering here. But I believe he's intentional with his prayer and listing his top priorities. And unity amongst his family is one of the top priorities. He prays that we might be one. We might experience together as one as we are one in Jesus. But why, why, why would Jesus pray that we would experience perfect unity? Why does it matter so much to Jesus? Think about it this way. If I do not have unity with his family, with his body, and we, if we are not one as a church, as a, as a family of Christ, then I'm not glorifying God. I'm, not, I'm probably not practicing holiness because I'm not, if I'm not in unity, I must have done something or not forgiven. I'm not practicing holiness. And if I'm not in unity with this church, I, I'm not a good witness to the world. So if I don't have unity in this house, I'm not gonna be effective out there. I'm not gonna be effective. I'm not gonna be glorifying God and I'm not gonna have personal holiness. Unity in God's family, it matters and it's foundational. That's why Jesus is praying. In Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six, Paul talks about, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. A lot of ones there. We are one in Jesus. These are some powerful, strong challenges and encouragements concerning us in our relationship with each other in God's house. God puts a value and a priority on it, and we see Paul saying, hey, be patient, be humble, make allowances for people's faults, they're gonna mess up, but because of your love, stay unified. Make every effort, every effort. I wanna make every effort in this house to be unified with God's family. I find it interesting that, that Paul and even Jesus, how he prays, he doesn't say that we need to produce unity, he doesn't say that we need to build unity, but he says we preserve unity, we keep unity. What does that mean? Jesus and the work that he did on the cross unified us already. As you look around in this place, we are all sinners, yes, but Jesus and what he did on the cross unifies us, and so therefore we're all, if you believe in him and you're a part of his family, we're all saved by him. We're all saved by him. That brings us together into one body, one kingdom, one family, united through one spirit, all equal under grace and mercy, under grace and mercy. We hold the same truth, we have the same mission, and we have the same love. It's Jesus who unifies us. We we don't start that, but we have to keep it. We have to keep the unity with each other. And unity in Jesus isn't based on our perspectives, your cultures, our rituals, our preferences, the flavor of service we like. Unity in Jesus is based on what Jesus did for us. It's based on his love for us. And it's based on him bringing us together in one family. Really, it's not, if you think of how we keep unity, it has nothing to do with your firstborn life. It, it has everything to do with how you are born again in Jesus, how you're born again. You may have heard it this way, but I love this thought that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level. We are all equals underneath the cross and what he did for us, and therefore then we can move forward in unity. We may be different, we may look different in this house today, but our differences should not divide us. They just shouldn't. I know all throughout the world today, every little thing can divide you. 
Every little thing. That's why I don't really like watching the news anymore because I just get anxious because everything the world says, everything the world's doing is divisive. They're trying to, every little issue, big issue, side issue, anything is divisive. The world is dividing itself, it's fragmented, and we are not called to do that. We are called for the opposite. Even if someone messes up, even if I make mistakes, even though I'm not perfect, I have unity in Jesus' name. Romans 12 talks about the differences that we have, but united in Jesus, it says in verse four, uh, 12 verses four, just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. There's many different parts to his body, many giftings, many talents, many different things in this house, but we are united in Jesus, and because of that, we belong not just to God, but we belong to each other. And some of you, as you turn to your left and your right, that may scare you a little bit. I belong to him, I belong to her. It shouldn't scare us, it shouldn't push us away, but those differences actually bring us together. What do I mean by that? Unity does not mean uniformity. Uniformity means I'm the same as everyone else. I'm carbon copy. We just need to go to uniformity. That's, what not, that's not what God is saying. That's not what the, he preaches. That's not what, what, what the Bible preaches. The Bible it celebrates difference, but underneath unity. Under, our goal isn't to try to become one another. Our goal is to belong to one another. Romans 12, verses 16 says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Ladies, don't elbow your husbands on that one. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that so you can live, or do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can. I love the word harmony there. It's a, actually a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful word picture. And, and, and we know it in the, in the context of song and in music. You heard our, our, our amazing choir this morning. And I want to talk through that. And, and I, I'm not going to sing to you like Pastor August did last week. Because I want you to love Jesus when you leave the house. And I want you to come back next week. So I know if I start singing, you, you're not going to want to come back. But when it comes to, to music, I may not be the most knowledgeable, you're like, well, you play drums. Well, I'm not musical, I just like to hit things really hard. And so I, I just go up there to blow off some steam maybe and I kind of consider myself more like animal from Muppets more than anything when I get up there. But, you know, Pastor Brett, he gives me all the grace and mercy and love so we can keep unity with each other up there. But harmony, when, it's, when you talk about harmony, uh, there's, there's two ways that, that you can sing in unison. You can sing as a choir. You can sing with more than one person. And those two ways are in harmony or in melody. And they're different. They're different. I learned about this this week. They're different. If you sing in melody, that is multiple people coming together and singing in the same key. They're on the same, they're in the same like-mindedness, if you will. They're singing in the same key the same way. They're singing the same thing in the exact same way. There's uniformity. They're all doing the same exact thing. But harmony is different. Harmony is different. Melody isn't bad at all. Melody isn't bad. But the Bible does not say melody. Live in melody with each other. It says live in harmony. Harmony is when you get different, diverse parts that are diverse lines of singing that are on the same key. They're singing the same thing, but a different way to come together to make a beautiful song, to come together. It, it is different diverse parts of soprano and alto and tenor and bass coming together. The difference is to make something powerful and beautiful. Melody is good, yes, but I would argue that harmony is better. It's better to celebrate where we're different, but that shouldn't disqualify us from unity. Harmony with each other, we come together a beautiful symphony, not in trying to be each other, but just belong to each other. That's what God wants his family to be like. That's what he wants his house to look like. An example of that is how Jesus 
the Holy Spirit and God the Father emulate that unity all the time. It's three diverse persons that are the same God. And I know that opens a can of worms. It's, it's kind of confusing. I understand that. But that is a beautiful picture for us, an example of we live in harmony, diverse, different, but yet coming in unity, in unity. Think of the Gospels. The four Gospels are an example of harmony. They're four different authors, four different perspectives, four different even histories of these authors. And yet they come together and they're, they're saying the same narrative. They're saying Jesus and they're talking about Jesus in a different way, different perspective. It's a beautiful picture of harmony. 1 Corinthians 12 too, just like I referenced in, in, in Romans, it says just as a body though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. John 17, just like we read Jesus' prayer, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. This is where God's priorities of unity and, and, and mission for the lost world come together. This prayer right here, that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. When the church is unified, when we come together in unison and in harmony together, it impacts the world. It is, a, it is evidence for the world. It is proof for the world, not only that God is real, that God loves us, but also that he loves them. It is evidence to them. John 13, 34 says, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you. You should love each other. For your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my, dis my disciples. How we love each other will prove, it's the proof to the world that we are following Jesus and that Jesus is worth following. It's the proof to them. They are always watching, the world is always watching how we live and how we love. And that love for one another, that love, it doesn't say your church attendance will prove, it doesn't say your beliefs will prove, it says your love for one another will prove. So our obedience is their evidence. The lost world, they can't see God, but they see you. They can't see God, but they see his family. They see his kids. They see the Christians. And how they see us will determine how they can approach God, if they can believe in God, if he's real, if he's worth believing in. If they see our love and unity, they can believe that God is love. If they see our hatred and division, they'll reject this message of the gospel. Let me ask you this, church, when the world sees your family, how you love, how you act, does it push people to Jesus? Does it point them to Jesus? You may have heard a phrase like, man, there's just something different about you. I love that. I love that when a non-believer says, there's just something different about you. They are pointing out the fact, they're pointing to the proof, they're pointing to the evidence, there's something different about you. There's something different and I wanna know what it is. How are they seeing us? What are they seeing in us? What are they seeing in our church? If they didn't know you went to church, would they know that you are a follower of Jesus? If they didn't know your beliefs, what you believed, would people know that you're a follower of Jesus? It's so much deeper than belief. It's so much deeper than, than attendance. It's so much deeper than that. And our proof is deeper than that. It's more powerful than that. If I were to go and I went behind your back and I asked your coworkers, distant relatives, people you come in contact with regularly, people who know you, if I talk to those people in your circles, in your spheres, and I ask them, tell me, tell me about them, what are they like? What would they say? How would, how, well, how, if I asked them, how do they treat people? What if I asked your enemies? Hello. 
what would they say? How do they treat people? How do they treat people? Our actions, how we love each other will prove to the world. It'll be proof to them something's different here. Something's worth following here. And here's the deal. When we look out into the world, like I said, it's so divisive. It's, it, it's so broken. It's fragmented. Every, every stinking thing is so, it, it's pushing us away from each other. It's breaking it down. I mean, you can't even, it's just, I could go on and on examples. And, and we could look at that world and just get so discouraged and say, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I'm just isolate from them, separate, I got my church family. That's not what God says us, it's not what he calls us to do. It's not what he prays for. He prays that, he, that they would be sent into the world. I'm not praying that they would be removed, just protected. And I think, you know what I think about our world when I think about how broken and divisive it is? I think we have been set up for the greatest opportunity to make a real and tangible impact right now. Satan doesn't know that he's working for us right now. Because he's made the world so broken and so divisive, you don't have to do much in loving per a person or responding in a right way. The world goes, whoa, that's different because it's so messed up. So don't look at the world saying, there's just too much, it's just too broken, I can't make an impact. In the opposite, the Holy Spirit is saying, because it's so broken, because it's so dark, now your light has a chance to shine bright instantly. Instantly, we can sometimes get in such a mode of just a paralyzing fear. I'm so afraid of what, what maybe they'll, they, like, they'll say. What if they ask me a tough question? I, I don't know, like, I, I'm not a preacher. How am I supposed to preach them? Like, what am I supposed to say? We get so caught up on our words sometimes that it, it, it paralyzes us from just acting. If you have someone in your life that you want to come to Jesus, radically serve them. Show radical generosity in their life. If you want someone that is your enemy, just challenge them on how the way you respond them. Love them into the kingdom of God. Instant, real impact. Is, and it's set up for us as a church for such a time as this. For such a time as this. I think I hear so much in the church, man, the world is more deprived than ever. Doom and gloom, this, all oh, this. I think we should be saying, hey, there's people out there that are not in the family of God yet, and we have the perfect environment to start doing that. We have the perfect environment. But just as our unity in the church, our love for one another is a positive evidence, is an impact to the world, our lack of obedience, our, 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 our disunity, our dissension and our division in the church is also a evidence. Our lack of obedience is also their evidence. What do I mean by that? In one example, in, in 2017, LifeWay Research did, did a study just on, just on demographic of 23 to 30 year olds. 66% of them said that they stopped attending church or they won't go to church right after 18 and their top reason was, 66% said just their top reason was the church members seemed divisive, judgmental, or hypocritical. It had nothing to do with the word of God, had nothing to do with this is just too hard, it's too big commitment, nothing to do with it's irrelevant, it's simply us. That hurts my heart. That God's people, God's family members would keep people from entering God's family. That hurts me. And, and, and I say that not to put judgment or condemnation on this house because I believe we are the exact opposite. I believe this house and you and us and we have done such an amazing job loving people, showing generosity, being in unity. I mean, look at the congregation that we have of multi-generational. Such an easy opportunity to be divisive just because of age. And we don't. We commit to each other. So I commend you, church, you are doing a fantastic job. But I say this to implore us, how our obedience with each other matters. It matters to a world. Thomas Manton said, divisions in the church always bring atheism in the world. It's sad to me 
that we even have a phrase, and you may have heard it before, called church hurt. I'm so saddened that that's even a phrase. I'm not denying that people don't have hurt. I'm not denying that they were hurt by, hurt, or by church people. But I'm just saying that people, the family of God, wouldn't respond in such a way that is making allowance for people's faults, being humble and gentle, doing everything that we can to live in unity and in peace. That's what we need to be doing. I don't think that there should be a thing called church hurt. I don't think there should be. Not because, once again, people shouldn't be hurting, but people in God's family, should, we just should be responding differently. We should be loving differently. We should be looking differently. I think Christians, a lot of times, we're known for what we're against rather than what we're for. I'm re I recall that when it comes to people coming to repentance, it doesn't say my belief system. It doesn't say what I stand up for. It doesn't say how I, uh, uh, you know, Beating people with truth leads to repentance. It says loving kindness, God's loving kindness leads people to repentance. And that's what we are to emulate in God's family, his loving kindness. And that draws people in more than anything. Was Jesus against things? Absolutely. Is he still against things? Absolutely he was. But he was also the one that said, I'm, I'm loving, I'm seeking and serving the lost people. I come as a servant, I come humbly, I come to love, that's what I came for. And he showed it on the cross. We, church, cannot adopt the world's narrative or their way of living by saying that I have to hate or dislike someone that I disagree with. I can't, I can't treat people like that. Because did you know that the Bible talks about that, that, and Jesus lived it, that loving someone has nothing to do with agreeing with them. It doesn't. I could have opposite viewpoints of people and I could still serve them. I could still love them. I could still love them. But if we are not in harmony as a church body, if we are not treating people in God's house like Jesus would, how are we gonna treat people in the world like Jesus would? First Corinthians 13, one says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Sounds like the opposite of harmony to me. Just noise, violent noise. And why would anyone out there want to come to a family that doesn't like each other? doesn't treat each other well. What, what, that's not attractive to anybody because the world is looking. The world is looking for a family to be a part of. They're desperately trying to be a part of a family that loves them and includes them and serves them and supports them. They're searching everywhere for it. It's fitting that we're talking Missions Weekend about India because over COVID, I don't know if you knew this, well, in India as a whole is one of the worst places in the world for, for prostitution, for human trafficking, for, for the level of brothels and, and, and that whole scene. It's one of the worst in the world. In India over COVID, because the, the, India just got rocked by it and it, it wrecked opportunities to get basic things like food, shelter. I mean, people, it just ruined the country. And so the, the, the people were at such a level of desperation that did you know that the pimps and the brothels and these human trafficking rings, instead of just stealing people, they started saying, we'll provide you food, we'll provide you a house, we'll provide you the necessary toiletries that you need for every day. And people started flocking. Mothers and fathers started giving up their kids saying, that's a better life than I can provide for them in my own house. People are looking for a family to be a part of. Did you know that in, in gangs all across the world, gang activity, that people flock to, to be a part of a gang? Why? Because they feel the opportunities that they would get. They feel loyalty. They feel supported. They feel the security of that family. The LGBTQ plus family does a really good job 
at loving, including, and celebrating people. They do. I think they do it on the best in the planet, and they, that may trigger you. I'm not saying they're celebrating the right thing. I'm just saying they love people really well. They love people really well. Everybody's looking for a family to be a part of. Why not the church? Why not God's family? Why can't we love people better than that community? Why can't we provide better than the pimps in India? Why can't we give opportunity and keep loyalty like a gang can? We should. We're supposed to be the greatest and most unified family on earth. What's what we're called to do? I'm thankful once again that this church, you guys do it so well, but we can do better. We can do better. We absolutely can. Because people will go to where they are loved and accepted. They want to be a part of a harmony. And we can't do those things and provide for a lost world when we are not unified first here. Worship team, would you come? D.L. Moody says, I have... I have never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. We need to be unified if God wants to use us. My friend has a story, my pastor friend, he told me this about a guy that got saved uh, and started coming to their church, a um, guy in his mid-20s. And my, this guy was just radically passionate about Loving people, serving people, you know, doing it all. He was just, just a fresh believer, didn't grow up in church. My friend asked this guy, you know, dude, or not asked him, just said, man, you're so passionate. I'd love to see you. We need more of that. And he said, I, I grew up in a Christian, around a Christian community. He said, I was mid-20s and not a single person had told me about the gospel. I had lived for 20 plus years surrounded by Christians, surrounded by people who claimed to be in the faith, but did not live with the faith. It led me to believe two things. This is what this guy is telling my pastor friend. That Christians say they believe in the Bible, or what, what, what Christians say they believe in the Bible they don't actually believe, or they don't care that I'm going to hell. Our lack of obedience as a church is evidence for a lost world. And especially for this guy, the evidence was that I don't actually believe the Bible. I don't actually believe that Jesus saves and changes lives. I don't actually believe that it just takes one encounter with him. I don't actually believe that I'm responsible and I'm sent into the world. I don't actually believe that Jesus is coming back soon and that there is a heaven and there is a hell. That's what our lack of obedience is telling the world, that we don't believe it, because I'm not acting on it. Our lack of obedience is also giving the world evidence that I just don't care enough about you. I don't really care where you're going for eternity. And I don't care what happens to you. We can say all these things that we want to say. We preach on it. We can rah-rah about it. But if we're not acting on it, it's evidence. It, it's revealing and our lack of action speaks very, very loud. Brendan Manning says the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips then walk out the door and deny him with, by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Would you stand all across this place? God has called us, he has sent us And we need to love each other so well in this house. We need to do it differently than the world. We need to respond differently. We forgive differently. We give differently. We need, it needs to start in here, but it can't just stay in here. Because you know what unity, it, 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 you know what unity and inclusion plus separation is? It's a cult. That's what cults do. We are not that, we are family. Did you know everybody on the planet is invited to this family? Every single person, they just don't know it yet. They just don't know it yet. So we need to be the people that we love first, we love well in here, and then we don't stop here. We go out and we love well. 
We love wealth not just with our time, not just with our, our money, not with just our voice, not with just our action, not with just our families. We love well with everything. Would you bow your heads for a second? I just want to give an opportunity just for a minute, just for one minute for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I know this message is one that's more of a send out message. This message applies to you more when the, the, the second you walk outside that door. But I wanna break it down in two things quick. First thing, you may be in this house and you may be feeling, man, I'm not even, I, I'm not even treating the house of God, the family of God well. There's some people, there's some this, there's some history, there's some hurt, and I need to deal with it. For unity's sake, Jesus prayed for you. And the Holy Spirit's revealing that to you right now. The next one is for, if that doesn't apply to you, then for the rest of us, it's who's around me? Who's around me? I understand, God, that my, my life is not random, it is written. The random trip to the grocery store, the random this, the random thing that happened today, the random encounter isn't so random, God. It's intentional and it's written for me. Jesus, reveal those things to me. Who do I need to love? Who do I need to love, God? Is my obedience an evidence of proof of you, God? Or is my lack of obedience showing something else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for speaking in this place. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us, dying for us, that you unified us in the same heart, in the same mind, so that we may go out. Thank you that we're plan A, God, that you trust in us. You've placed your spirit on us to go out, Jesus. Help us to love better. God, all of our sinful natures and our, our sinful responses to things, God, would you cut those things down and out of our lives that we would respond in the way to things, to, to arguments, to, to hurts, to, to opportunities, God. We would respond as you would respond. Thank you, God, that we as a church, a unified family, get the opportunity to change the world, not just our community. Would you use us this week, God? Use us this month, God. Stir our hearts as we go through the missions weekends, Jesus, of what not we can just do, but what we can give to you, Jesus. Use us, Heavenly Father. Use us, God. Unify us by your Spirit. With uh, your heads bowed still, I just want to give an opportunity. If there's anybody in this place that you would say, hey, I recognize I'm invited into the family of God and I want to accept that invitation. I want to be a part of a unified, loving body. I want to be a part of a family that's saved by Jesus. I recognize my need for a savior. And you want to just admit that in, in a sign of a statement of faith by raising your hand and looking up at me so I can just pray with you. If you want to do that, would you just do that now? If that applies to you, I want to accept that invitation this morning. I just want to pray with you. God, that you unified us by your spirit, what you did on the cross. Use us this week in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Church, this is a message for out there. The world isn't ready for the type of love we're about to show, right? They're not ready. And we're about to see some amazing things as you step out in faith and be led by the spirit. So we love you. We bless you. Church online, we love you. We bless you. Come back tonight. We'll see you missions weekend invite some peeps it's going to be amazing love you church have a phenomenal spring day today <laughs>